friends and guardians. My name is Wonwala Yomi Odedei, the Acting Experiential Learning Lead, K-12, at the Halton District School Board. I am very happy to welcome you to our presentation tonight on the Skilled Traits and Technology Information Evening. The purpose of this event is to shine light on the various options that are available for your children and wards on the skilled trades pathway at the Halton District School Board. Before we begin, I would like to read the land acknowledgement. I, Wonwala Yomiodedei, on behalf of the Halton District School Board and all those here present tonight, will be honoring the land and territory. Halton, as we know it today, is rich in history and modern traditions of many First Nations and the Métis, from the Anishinaabe to the Atawandron, the Odinosone, and the Métis. These lands surrounding the Great Lakes are steeped in indigenous history. As we gather today on these treaty lands, we have the responsibility to honor and respect the four directions, land, waters, plants, animals, ancestors that walked before us and all the wonderful elements of creation that exist. We would like to acknowledge and thank the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation for sharing their traditional territory with us. The connection I would like to make for us with the reading of the land acknowledgement is to draw our attention to the Halton District School Board that is hosting the director's panel series on identity, inclusion, and human rights for students, staff, and community members to raise awareness on historical and contemporary challenges on identity, equity, inclusion, and human rights. The next session will focus on two-spirit and transgender awareness. This event will take place on Tuesday, March 29th at 6 to 7.30 p.m. Details are posted on the hdsb.ca website. Next, I would like to give an overview of tonight's agenda. So welcome to the Skilled Trades and Technology events at the Halton District School Board. We have tonight our keynote address um, will be given by Jamie McMillan, who is a skilled trades advocate. Next, we're going to have Angela Wilkins from the Skills Ontario, who is the Skills Ontario Liaison Officer. This will be followed by question and answer period. So for the question and answer, should you have any question for any of the presenters tonight, on the skill trades and technology event, feel free to visit bit.ly slash 22 HDSB trades. Please complete the form by adding your questions and they will be answered at the end of the presentation. Remember to hit the submit button at the bottom of the said form. I will now hand over to my colleague, Mr. Wade Richardson, who is the Ontario Youth Apprenticeship Recruiter at the Halton District School Board. Please join me in welcoming Mr. Richardson. Sorry. Hi, I'm Wade Richardson, our OEAP recruiter for the Hull District School Board. Today we're going to talk about the skilled trades. The skilled trades are important to society because they because skilled trades people build, maintain, and repair the items we use every day. The skilled trades usually require a combination of activity-based work and applying the knowledges in that trade. In Ontario, there is 144 skilled trades and hundreds of non-apprenticeable trades. And there are lots of opportunities for all students to become skilled tradesperson or learn about the skilled trades and find out what is right for them in high school. A typical apprenticeship is a combination of paid and on the job training 
that were, a, were a, an apprentice would learn in a college setting while they do their different levels of apprenticeship. There we go. So why are the skilled, why the skilled trades? The skilled trades really provide students and adults with excellent career opportunities. And there is a lot of opportunities for advancement in the skilled trades and they are in demand and they really have multiple career paths. The skilled trades are really satisfying careers. Tradespeople can see the finished product of the hard work they've done and the effort they put in and they have a pride in their accomplishments and whether they have designed, built or repaired something, they can leave at the end of the day and say, hey, I did that. And be, and when they walk by later on, long on, they can point out to friends and family says, I did that. And it's a very rewarding career being able to see the product of your accomplishments down the road. And apprentices learn from skilled tradespeople who pass on their knowledge to the next generation. So apprentices, typically while they're working, they learn from a, a skilled trades journeyman and they're paid while they learn, while they create their apprenticeship and most often will complete their apprenticeship and get their certificate of qualification with no debt and will have made money all along the way. So why, why were we talking about the skilled trades and why do we hear so much about it in the news and on different social media platforms? Because there is a big demand for the skilled trades because right now the government expects by 2025, there will be a labor shortage of over 1.2 million workers in Canada. That is a lot of people uh, and, a, and a lot of those positions are coming because the average age of a skilled tradesperson in Ontario right now is 58. So a lot of those people will be retiring very shortly. And the government also thinks that there will be, um, by 2025, 40% of the employment in Canada will be in the skilled trades. And quite often we talk about the skilled trades, we may think it's male dominated, but really it's not. The skilled trades shouldn't be male dominated because the skilled trades has no gender. Women can perform any job as well, if not some quite often better than a male counterparts. Women are increasingly joining the skilled trades and completing their apprenticeship and becoming licensed skilled trades professional. And to, when I talk to students and I speak to, speak to skilled trades people, the reality is that the skilled trades is often a two to five year apprenticeship. And by the time they've done their training, and completed all the necessary requirements of that skilled trade and wants to become licensed journey person, quite often that's just the jumping point of their career. So uh, quite often skilled trades people become inspectors, they become entrepreneurs, managers, and as their knowledge grows, really the opportunities grow and the amount of opportunities is really endless. So uh, we'd like to talk a little bit about um, career education life planning programs for grades 7 to 12. So there are lots of planning in Halton District School Board that exposes students to all of the post-secondary pathways and career options. The HJSB has been a big supporter of the skilled trades and technology opportunities for students right from uh, starting next year K to grade 12 which is a, uh, is a government initiative and we're seeing lots of innovation and creativity coming in with all the STEM projects entering in the elementary and secondary classrooms. And there are many opportunities for, or there are many community partnerships with Halton Region that allows employers and organizers to support the skilled trades exploration and work together to engage school students in their career planning because Quite often we try very hard to um, career plan with students, but this, it is very hard for students to career plan if they don't know what careers are available and can't gain those experiences. And quite often we're going to classrooms and we're um, bringing skilled trades people in and doing events like this so students can understand what the opportunities are out there. So many of the skilled trades are connected to tech ed classes. 
in, in, in elementary and in secondary. So in, in elementary, um, we're here tonight and we're, we wanna talk about it's not too early to start the planning and exploring the opportunities that are available for the skilled trades with the children and the wards. Um, I'd like to tell you that in Halton um, School Board, there are lots of opportunities for students to explore <clears throat> and find out more information and about and available options for them. And we wanna inform them about all the different types of experiential learning they can do in elementary schools so they can be more aware of their options once they go, once they graduate and move up to high school. Because in high school, there are a lot of opportunities in te technological education classes for those students to um, be successful and learn about future careers and make those decisions in high school before they leave high school and are not and are not aware of their options and maybe take courses that they're really not interested in. Oops. Sorry. So I believe we're going to pass this over to Winona. Thanks, Mr. Richardson. The big question in our minds as parents and guardians and grandparents tonight is, what do I do next after this presentation? We are encouraged to do the following. Please speak to your child's teacher about school specific opportunities. Learn more about the opportunities offered by the skilled trade specific organizations. Take technology education courses in high school Learn more about OYAP and SHISM program at the HDSB. Learn skill trades opportunities, and you can visit bit.ly slash skilled trades resource in order to get more information. And remember to visit bit.ly slash 22 HDSB trades to fill the Google form to ask your questions. Questions will be answered at the end of the presentation. And now I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Mr. Richardson to in introduce our keynote speaker and then the representative from Skills Ontario. Thank you. Hi, and thank you very much, Jamie McMillan uh, for joining us. Jamie is a skills advocate for the skilled trades. She is a founder and primary spokesperson for of work boot careers. She is a motivational speaker, a journey person, iron worker, and boilermaker, and author, visionary advocate for the skilled trades and technologies. And she's a, a big advocate for mental health and homelessness with the youth. We quite often see Jamie in a lot of elementary schools doing presentations and really um, providing a lot of information to the students about the skilled trades and their options. We are just going to watch a short video and then we'll ask Jamie to participate. All right, hello. I'm just gonna try and pin myself up here and uh, I will start chatting. So my name is Jamie and as you just seen in my video, you see me running around on the steel doing what I would normally do if I was in the workplace. And uh, right now I just came home from the workplace. So I still got my earplugs on me and I saw my glasses and I probably have hat head under all this, but I was at work all day today and I had to do a really cool job. I was working with a bunch of pre-apprentices who are considering getting into school tra skilled trades, and some of them are coming out of the OEA program. And we were at the Center of Excellence learning all about welding in the nuclear industry. And it was so very, very cool. But I have a company called Work Boot Careers, and through my company, I speak to approximately 50,000 students across the province every year. I also get to travel and talk to students in United States and across other provinces here as well. I speak to employers. I get to do a lot of great things. But if I were to take you all the way back in time and talk to you about me in grade school, in elementary school, totally different story. When I was in elementary school, I will tell you that I got picked on and bullied. I had ADHD really badly. I had learning disabilities. And because of being picked on, bullied, I remember getting beat up and silly stuff like that. It was really hard on my mental health. 
Now, so much has changed since then because way back when I was in elementary school, school was looked at very differently. They were all about you know, those pathways where you're an academic student and they didn't really recognize that students who were more hands-on visual learners were just as intelligent, just in a different way. And thankfully that has been changing and evolving over the years. I was lucky because when I ended up in high school, things kind of changed, but I recognized that those credits, those credits that I really, really excelled in were those elective credits, the ones that we get to choose, that the government doesn't force us to choose, and then we get to use those credits towards our future. So when we get to high school, all of a sudden we're supposed to start realizing what we're going to do for the rest of our life and our future, and then we take these elective credits to like complement that. I had no idea. I just literally signed up for elective credits because they sounded like a lot of fun. And growing up, my father was a minor and he liked to buy and renovate houses. My mother was a nurse and she was brilliant as well. And she would like read books on electrical and do the electrical because back then there wasn't the same regulations as now. So I was always around construction, but my parents supporting me to get into construction was a totally different story. Because my dad was a miner, I would mention sometimes from time to time that I wanted to get into mining. And my dad was like, no way, my daughter's not getting into a male-dominated career. Uh-uh. Anyways, in high school, I did super, super well in the shop classes. I ended up taking small engine mechanics. I took a double woodworking shop class in grade 12. And being from Timmins, you're all around windmills. So I remember 28 boys in the class, two girls, because one of the girls was my friend Bridget that I dragged to take this class with me. And because we're in Timmins, we're next to a woodmill. And we have this unlimited supply of lumber that year. So our teacher's like, yep, you design something, you present it to me. If I agree with it, I will let you build it. And of course, a bunch of grade 12 boys all had guns and they all went partridge hunting and stuff. And uh, so this one guy, Chris, thinks I'm going to build myself a gun cabinet. And next thing you know, that's what all the boys wanted to build. And 28 boys built gun cabinets. Now, I don't want a gun cabinet but I did have a tiny room with a high ceiling and I wanted to maximize my space. And so I designed a bed that was seven feet high. It had a closet with shelf, a desk with drawers, a ladder to get to the top. And I remember J Mr. Jakubiak calling me in front of the class and he's like, Jamie, you're never going to finish this project. I can't approve this for you. And I like begged. It was double woodworking. I'm like, come on, I can do this. I'm going to put my mind to it and I will get it done. So here I do it. I dive into this. I get it done. I get the highest mark, the biggest project they ever seen in a high school done by a female. And nobody told me I can get into skill traits. Nobody said, hey, Jamie, did you know that there's pathways from college in college that you can take technical programs that can lead you into a skilled trade? Did you know you can go into an apprenticeship and you don't even have to burden your parents with the idea of paying for your education? You don't need to work a second job or go get it you know, alone, you can literally jump out of school and take this apprenticeship and earn while you learn. Nobody told me this. They said I had to go to college to be like, you know, administrative tasks or a nurse or dental hygienist. They didn't say anything about skilled trades. And so me being me, I had that ADHD. I did not want to sit still in class. I actually did not like high school. So I decided that school wasn't for me. I was just going to move on with my own path, get a job at McDonald's and everything was going to be great. Not a good idea. McDonald's doesn't give you a very good salary to make a living from. And so I ended up a couple, not long after my parents ended up convincing me to go back to school. They wanted me in healthcare. They thought that that was going to be the best path for me. And so they pushed for me to go to college. They said they would pay for it if I took a nursing program. So I decided to find the shortest one to become a personal support worker. 20 weeks long. How hard can it be? <laughs> Toughest class of my life. 14 weeks in the classroom. I nearly, I nearly, I thought I was going to fail. I got the lowest marks in the class. But then we had to do this co-op where we went out in the community and worked with elderly people. Turned out to be the best thing. I ended up loving this job so much. I loved these elderly people that were so wise. They just needed help. And it felt so good to help them. And I got a job right out of school. I ended up doing that for the next couple years. My parents were very proud of me. I was making a lot more money. I can get my own apartment. I can start doing better things, hanging out with better people. And things were moving forward until somebody died. And then all of a sudden, that job didn't feel so good anymore. 
You get into healthcare, you work with elderly people, you expect that one day they're going to pass away, but you're not prepared for the first time it happens. And I was not prepared. And this person was like a grandfather to me. And I decided I didn't want this job anymore, that it wasn't something I wanted to do for the rest of my life. Now, my parents convinced me to stay for a couple more months, and I did. They really wanted me in that career. But they didn't understand that it just, I just couldn't do it. My mom had the heart for it. I didn't. My dad was very mechanical and I was always dad's little boy because I was the oldest girl and he didn't have any boys. So I was helping him with the firewood and renovations. So I had this in me already. Years go by and I decide to just work as a waitress. I moved from Timmins to Toronto and then I end up from Toronto to Hamilton and I'm still just working as a waitress. My life is not really going anywhere. I'm not putting money in the bank. I'm spending a lot of money. I don't want to go back to college or university. I don't know what to do with my life until one miraculous day. I am walking to the grocery store. I am living paycheck to paycheck. I'm pretty much like on the verge of being homeless, I'm hardly making things work together. And my mental health is in a really different place because I feel like I'm that kid again in school that was picked on and bullied and told I wasn't smart. I was never going anywhere in life. But this day, as I'm walking down the street in Hamilton and I'm trying to put in applications, I'm trying to think of something better to do with my life. I want to do something better with my life. I'm walking down the street, a one-way street in Hamilton. I just had moved here. This is a town of 500,000 people, 500 miles from my hometown, where I don't think I know anybody except for my roommate. But as I walk down the street, a girl gets a phone call. She has to pull over to answer her phone. When she pulls over to answer it, it's somebody giving her directions, and she has a pen to write down the directions, but it's out of ink. So she asks the stranger walking by on the street when she rolls down her window for a pen. That stranger was me. And she was my high school nemesis. As it turns out, she gets out of the car. We talk like nothing's wrong. And she tells me that she's an iron worker. I have no idea what she's talking about. But she says she's been doing that for 10 years. She's making $100,000 a year. She never had to go to college or university. She has no debts to pay back. She is loving her job. She says she works in construction. I say, it sounds really good. She says, you know, if you're ever looking for a job, you should go up to the ironworkers and apply. You'd probably do good at it. I end up going up to the ironworkers and I applied. I got a letter in the mail, but two months later that said, Mr. McMillan. My name's Jamie. Maybe it was the best thing. I got into the ironworkers union and that was 20 years ago. I've spent the last 20 years having the time of my life. I found a job that not only was the best medication for my ADHD, but that I didn't have to pay for. I found a career that paid me to earn well I learned. I got to go to work every day and build all these fantastic structures with my hands. And I got to see the accomplishments of the work that I was doing at the end of the day. And it was amazing. I was outside. I felt happy. I was getting my vitamin D dosage every day. I was getting strong. I was fitter than I'd ever been in my life. There was so much diversity in the job that one day I could be welding. The next day I could be putting up structural steel. A week later, I'd be working in a steel plant. And a month later, I could be working in a car plant. And it was always different people. And yes, sometimes I was the only girl on a job. And I'm not going to say that there was ever any struggles from that. But there's not just struggles for women in the workforce. There's struggles for everybody in the workforce. We all have good days and bad days. We all have people that talk gossip and don't like us. And we do have people that like us. But the most important thing is that when you go to work, you work because you want to be there. You work because you're passionate about your job. If you have good worth ethic and passion to succeed, there's nothing that you can't do. When my dad first found out I was an iron worker, he was having no part of it. He wasn't exactly happy. My mother, uh, she ended up being excited because my mom always kind of did guy things anyway. She liked fixing up the house and doing things. And that was considered, you know, man's jobs back then. So my mom was more supportive. I started the trades in 2002 and it wasn't until 2007 that Chatelaine Magazine decided they wanted to do this article on six women around the world that were in male dominated dangerous jobs. And I was elected by somebody as one of these women. So they ended up contacting me to be in this magazine. 
Well, that was the turning point for my dad. He walked around Timmins and he bought every single magazine on every rack in the store. And he went around and showed me off to all his friends, giving magazines away and telling them all that I welded 300 feet up in the air on a beam. I don't do that all the time. I've done it a couple of times, but my dad was just so excited about it. So my parents finally came around and that felt so good for me because a lot of times we just want our parents approval and a lot of kids try to make their parents happy like I did. I went and took a career that I loved for a short time, but it wasn't my lifelong career. I was never going to move up that ladder because I didn't have the interest in doing a job like that. Now we just hit this world pandemic and this world pandemic showed us a bunch of things. When we're trying to figure out what careers we want to get into, we want to remember this world pandemic. We want to remember those people that sat at home and those people who were out there working, the people who almost lost their houses or did lose their houses and lost their jobs, lost their vehicles because they couldn't afford it because they didn't have a job that would provide a sustainable income no matter what would happen in the world. One thing we did find out, and I'm so happy to say this, is that we found out through the pandemic that skilled trades have been put on the back burner so long that we have this huge deficit now. We have all these people that are retiring from skilled trades and no one coming into the skilled trades to take their place. And the skilled trades are amazing. They're jobs everybody can do. Actually, technology has advanced skilled trades so much that it's not like that you know, big muscle work anymore where you're busting your butt every day to go to work and working hard and getting banged up. It's not like that at all. Ironworking is one of the top 10 most dangerous jobs in the world, according to all the searches that you do. But I'm a female and I do my job just fine. In fact, I love my job and I'm very safe at work. I'm very vigilant of all the things around me. I'm safe. I tie off. I do my safety machines. If you do all those, there's nobody that can't be in skilled trades that wants to be there. These are pathways for everybody. And these are opportunities that kids can start learning about at a very early age. In fact, we now have a coloring book through work boot careers that targets kids in elementary schools. We have presentations for kids of all ages right up to high school. And then we provide ongoing mentorship. I do love the programs that they offer at high school. And I think that this should be compulsory. I think that every student that goes to high school should not have certain classes as electives. They should definitely be made to take these classes. And I will tell you why. If you want to have a vehicle someday in life, isn't it smart to take one of those auto shop classes and learn about transportation and how to maintain your vehicle? How many of you spend so much money every year getting an oil change? calling a tow truck if you get a flat tire, not knowing how to do the basic things to maintain your own vehicle. So you go to Jiffy Lube and you pay so much more than you'd pay if you just did it in your own driveway at home, if you had that experience. How many of you don't know how to fix things around your house because you didn't take a construction class that was free while you were in school? So you're willing to pay somebody $200 to plaster over a hole in the wall, or you pay an electrician to install a light that you could have learned how to do for free. And these are things that every student should have to take because in our modern world, that's so important. We need to change that curriculum system, but not just for skilled trades. We need to change it with financial literacy as well so that the next time something happens, people will be prepared because they're gonna save their money and learn how to spend it properly. I've seen, I've seen a lot of people in skilled trades make so much money that right away they're like a second year apprentice and they're like, oh, I need this $92,000 truck. Yeah. And they go and buy it. And then the thing about construction sometimes is it could be up and down. So if you don't save for a rainy day, maybe it's slow for a little bit because when I was out in Fort McMurray, we had the forest fires and everything had to shut down for a while. And some people didn't save the money for a rainy day and they lost those $92,000 trucks. So financial literacy, auto, construction. And one other one I want to say, and I think this is super important and COVID taught us this as well, mental health. Everybody should have to take some sort of mental health sensitivity training to learn how to work with different people and how to manage their own reactions and uh, uh, attitudes with the people in the workplace. That's what I think is important. I am living proof that skilled trades can literally be a life-changing choice.
I went into the skilled trades thinking that I had nothing in life and I became an iron worker. I ended up getting my journeyman ticket in three years and two months. Then I ended up getting a welding ticket. I have forklift ticket, every single ticket that you could possibly imagine that an iron worker can have, I got for free through either my union or my company or whoever I was working for at the time. Who knew I'd ever be a professional speaker with my own company? I was thought most likely to fail in life when I was young, but you know what? Eventually I became so passionate about this whole skill trades pathway. It's like, why didn't anybody tell me about this while I was in school? I would have jumped all over this. So now it's so important for me to educate people that now through my company, I'm speaking to thousands of students a year. How amazing is that? And then I was working out in the oil sands, building a gas and oil plant and the iron workers all got laid off, but the boiler makers couldn't find enough people to fill the job. So we all went back as boiler makers and now I'm a boiler maker apprentice and I absolutely love it. There's so much transferable skills that you learn when you take these classes. So even if you take the classes in school and you decide this isn't what you want to do, the practical life skills are amazing. That's why I think everybody should be able to take these programs or should, should be a must to take these programs. The other crazy things is that through my company work boot careers, I never realized that I would end up in the places that I am. Here I am speaking to all these students being recognized by employers, receiving awards for inspiring and motivating the next generation of workers to come up, being called like a mentor and being called an expert in this industry. I never thought I would be an expert in anything, but I'll tell you one of the most extraordinary moments in my life. One of the most extraordinary moments was I was down in Colorado hanging out with my friend Kayleen McCabe, who happens to be an HGT celebrity that I met through this and she's actually one of the real ones. She she has her own contracting company. She actually builds and does stuff on her own as well. And I'm in Colorado with her and we're standing on top of this great big mountain. When I get a phone call, because there's an announcement being made on national TV in Canada by Justin Trudeau. And the national announcement being made was that I was chosen as one of three people across this entire country to work with the government on a campaign to help the government find ways to promote skilled traits to youth. Here I am, this girl who got picked on and bullied and never thought I would succeed in life. All the people who treated me poorly got to hear that day on national TV what skilled traits could do for somebody. And wow, that was like, I always like to say success is the best revenge. Don't get mad at people. Just work harder, do your best and prove them wrong. That day I got to, and it was a really proud moment. And since then, everything has just taken off in my life. Letting people know that they can choose on their own, that they have their own pathway. To give them that ability can be life-changing. Now, I often say, I wish I knew when I was younger so I would have taken that pathway right away. But I think if I was younger, I might do the same path again. Only because I think that we have certain things that happen to us in a certain sequence in our life that leads us down the pathway that we're supposed to be on. If I did get into skill trades all those years ago, I probably wouldn't be standing here talking to people now and encouraging them to get into skill trades. And I'm telling you, over the years that I've been doing this, I have seen so many lives be transformed to the point where now I have a team of people that work with me at Work Boot Careers, and all of them have come from skilled trades as well. And some of them were the students that I encouraged all the way from elementary school right through to high school, and now some of them are in trades. So thank you so much for having me today. I'm here to answer questions. And no matter what your pathway is in life, no matter where you're going, what you've done, what you're doing, I wish you all the best because honestly, one third of your life is work, and you want to make sure that that career you have makes you happy. So thank you so much for listening. Thank you very much, Jamie. That was quite inspiring. Um, now, next, we have Angela Wilkins, the liaison manager from Skills Ontario. <laughs> Hi, everyone. So um, I'm having a difficult time turning my camera on but I will keep trying, um, so sorry for that. Um, so my name is Angela and I am the Liaison Program Manager at Skills Ontario. 
Um, so Skills Line Career is a not-for-profit organization um, that promotes careers in the skilled trades and technologies to the youth of Ontario. I'm here today to tell you a little bit about some of the opportunities, events, programs that Skills Ontario will be doing for the rest of this year to help expose youth to the skilled trades, um, to be able to work with your hands, test out some careers, and meet mentors who also work in the skilled trades. So just so you know, I will be sharing a number of opportunities with you. So if you'd like to learn a little bit more about any of them, um, I encourage you to visit our website, skillsontario.com, to get some more information. I was wondering if we could go back to the previous page for just one moment. I'd also like to encourage you to download our free app, um, it's, which is just down there on the, the sort of bottom of this, this slide. So in the app, you can see which career paths could be the right fit for you. Um, you can learn a little bit more about how to succeed in the trades. Um, and you can take an aptitude quiz um, to sort of see which uh, careers in the skilled trades are right for you. You can uh, browse through links uh, for partnered organizations, calendars of events, and there's a lots of information on frequent scholarships and employment opportunity updates. So if you want to download the app, you can explore skilled trades and technologies with us. Um, could you switch to the next page? Sorry. So Skills Ontario prioritizes creating equal opportunities for all youth through accessible and inclusive programs. We are committed to removing any barriers and serving all Ontarians through opportunities to explore their career pathways. As an organization, we strive to, to build a diverse and inclusive skilled workforce. So two of the things that we'll be doing um, with regard um, to our diversity, equity, and inclusion is that every Wednesday in April, we will be hosting a virtual event series that educates newcomers on skilled trade and technology supports and pathways, including information on applying to apprenticeship programs. Students, parents, and guardians are all encouraged to attend. Uh, and on June 1st, we will be having our Urban Tech Conference, which is an informative, interactive, and hands-on virtual experience where participants will be able to learn technology about technology careers, engage in panel discussions, um, and participate in workshops. Skills Ontario's First Nation, Métis, and Inuit initiatives aim to increase the awareness of Indigenous youth in the rewarding careers opportunities that exist in the skilled trades and technologies. Our trade and tech days happen throughout the year um, and are an opportunity for youth who identify as First Nation, Métis, Inuit, and non-status to meet and network with community members who have already chosen a career in the skilled trades and technologies. Youth learn about the journey of these mentors and explore their interests through experiential activities. And on May 3rd, we will be having our annual FNMI Student Conference. It's going to be virtual this year. The event helps youth understand the rewarding career options in the skilled trades and technologies while also celebrating a shared cultural heritage and the success of FNMI youth across Ontario. We also have Skills Ontario's Young Women's Initiatives. So our Young Women's Initiatives are a collection of engaging and hands-on events that happen all throughout the, the year. Um, they provide skills development and mentorship opportunities to young women. Um, at the end of March and twice in April, you can register um, to one of our parent guardian information nights for young women. Um, they connect high schools uh, programs to apprenticeship programs to employers and they engage through thought provoking conversations that challenge the stigmas behind careers in the skilled trades and technologies. Throughout these events, parents and guardians will have the opportunity to learn about the options that are available to youth starting in high school with OYAP. Um, what programs are available in college within a specific sector um, and what partnerships exist between local high schools and colleges and employers. Um, you can learn a little bit about OYAP, explore local college um, and um, we also have our Skills Ontario Conference com um, on May 3rd. So it's a young women's conference, it's an annual conference, and this year it will be hap happening virtually. So although these events are geared towards young women in grades seven to 10 and their parents and guardians, everyone are welcome at them. So the next thing that I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about are our summer camp programs. Um, so we do run virtual workshops all throughout the year. We just did a really big one over March break. Um, and we will be doing them for the rest of the year, but also a lot in the summer. Um, so we'll be doing virtual workshops in the summer, but we're also going to be doing um, actual summer camps, like uh, in-person summer camps throughout the summer. So in-person camps and virtual workshops. And these are great opportunities for students entering grade seven 
grade eight and grade nine to test out some careers in the skilled trades, um, work with some tools, work with their hands, build and create things and meet new people. So our workshops are led by college professors and people working in the industry um, and some of our staff at Skills Ontario. So I encourage you to check out some of those as well. And that's uh, some of the events and programs that Skills Ontario is running for the rest of this year. Um, if you want to check out more of the things that we're running, though, make sure to check out our website at skills www.skillsontario.com. Thank you so much. Thank you so, very much, uh, Angela. That was very informative. Jenny, you as well for your presentation, the passion, the interest, and we I would say that we actually re received a lot of information tonight. So now we're going to go to the question session. Now that we have come to the end of the presentation, thank you to all the presenters. We actually appreciate what you have, the information that you have shared with us. So we're going to open the floor for questions. And remember that if you haven't entered your question, this is an opportunity for you to go to bit.ly slash 22 HDSB trades. So remember to enter your question. Don't forget to hit the submit button because sometimes people enter questions and then they, they leave. They don't, they forget to hit the submit button. Until you hit the submit button, we will not get your question. So we have a few questions here already. And um, I will start with um, the first um, question. And either um, Angela, either of the panelists can actually take the, 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 the question. So um, I will direct this one to Angela. The question is, what government help is out there for tuition and education expenses? And how does someone go about getting government course expenses? I believe that Mr. Richard Sintu can fill in after Angela has answered the question because Mr. Richardson will have a lot more information as well. Did you want to go first, Wade? Yes, please, Angela. Sure, absolutely. So there are a lot of opportunities within Halton and Southern Ontario that the government is, is having programs and, and a lot of the programs are with colleges. There's, there's certain initiatives at different colleges for different skilled trades and with actually union, union centers where they will sponsor a pre-apprenticeship programs where, where a student could take a pre-apprenticeship program. And for, for example, I believe there's an electrical one at Niagara College and there is some at Conestoga but they're constantly evolving and constantly changing. So those initiatives and, and those um, different pre-apprenticeship pre programs can do, they do change and they change constantly. So you really have to visit websites and, and you know, dig deep and find that information. There is a skills center in, in uh, Burlington where they have some pre-apprenticeship programs in several different trades where they are very successful at giving people the opportunity to gain those skills and have those skills to go out and see an employer. And uh, there, is, there are lots of grants and such for, for people entering the trades for when they complete different levels of their apprenticeship. And um, there are tool grants and there, there are lots of things out there. And most of them can be found, those types of grants can be found at the, at the ministry on the Ontario website. I think it's um, apprenticeship.ca. So there are lots of opportunities out there to, for tuition to help with those expenses. And it, it varies depending on that, whether you're male, female, and the specific trade, because the sp trades that are in more higher demand do have higher support. I don't know if you'd like to build on that, Angela. Yeah, no, you did a great job. So um, with regard to what you were talking about, about grants that the government gives out for people entering apprenticeship programs and sort of continuing apprenticeship programs, I'm actually going to send you a whole, uh, I'm going to send the folks at your board a whole bunch of resources, like including a lot of um, grant information. So you can kind of go through the information and see which ones sort of relate to you. Um, oh yeah, there are a lot of grants for apprenticeship programs. Thank you, Angela, and wait. The next question, actually, it would take um, a whole lot of us, all of us will, will chip in one way or another, um, that my son 
and daughter are both presently in grade 12 and plan on taking a gap year. They are both interest, interested in apprenticeship program, welding at college. Both are presently enrolled in Shizim program at, I'm not going to mention the name of their school, co-op. Any advice for them? Do they contact their college of choice this fall to inquire about apprenticeship um, program and requirement for application? It's quite long, but the basis is that they're interested in apprenticeship. So what are the next steps that they need to take? But they're taking a gap year right now. So um, Wade, do you want to go first? And um, yeah. Absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to answer that. So welding and culinary is a great career. Um, and it, it is a great career and hopefully it is right for them. And the probably the best thing for them to do is take a, either a culinary and welding program at that school because they the particular school mentioned does have that high specialist high skills majors in those programs which are typically three credits in class credits some are four with a two credit co-op and that gives those, those students the opportunity to go out and visit and participate in that career and find out if it is right for them and that is where co-op is so important because we we can say we'd like to be a welder until you go out and experience it you really don't know what it is until you've actually worn those boots. So my recommendation is absolutely, they should take those programs in high school, come back. And if it is right for them, quite often in Halton, those students, if they're out and they're out of co-op welding, um, they often can, they can start an apprenticeship because quite a, there's probably around 35 or 40, depending on the year, apprentices registered in, in Halton. And some of them are welders, some of them are um, automotive service technicians, some of them are electricians. And that is a great way to find out if the career is right for them. And it's a great way to find it, to start their apprenticeship. And the reality is, if it's a student who goes through high school and start and finds an employer, starts an apprenticeship and is employed by that particular employer and continues upon graduation, the reality is they really don't need to go to college. Because if they if they decide they would like to be a welder, went to college and did that two year program, they would still have to complete that two year program and then complete their apprenticeship on top of that. So a lot of times I will refer to those college programs as a great way to get those skills in order to match up with an employer and hit the job hit the floor running. And that's really what those programs do. Thank you, Wade. Um, the next question says that what is the difference between college, university, and apprenticeship? But there is also a fourth um, pathway, which is the workplace as well. I'm just um, um, add, answer, adding that to the, to the parent who or student who asked the question. So they want to know the difference between college, university, and apprenticeship. Yeah, I, the, um, Angela, do you want to answer this or should... I think we probably both know the same information, Mr. Richardson, so it's up to you. Oh, you're welcome yeah, to go you... ahead. And then um, if I could add anything, I will. Or okay. you, may, you may have some information I am not aware of. <laughs> so at Skills Ontario, we like to say that all of the pathways are equally good. They're just different. Um, and so whichever one you choose, we just want to make sure you're choosing one that's best for you as an individual, because you can be successful with all of them, you know, as long as you're really thinking about it and choosing the one that's best for you, because they're all equally good. And so for us, the main difference between college and university um, is so... Whereas university is around 100% classroom based. Um, so, you know, theory, which is just, you know, sitting in a classroom, taking notes, reading, doing research, taking tests, studying. College is half that. So college is about 50-50. Roughly 50% 50 of college is pretty much the exact same as university. But the other 50% of college is very practical, very hands-on. Uh, so usually college teachers or college professors are already um, professionals in the thing that you're studying. So you're, you're, you're learning kind of directly from um, professionals 
who are now teaching about that. Um, and apprenticeship programs are, we would like to say 90-10. So only 10% of an apprenticeship program happens in class. And it's very similar to how you would learn in a college, but the other 90% of an apprenticeship program is very practical, very hands-on, and you get paid for it. That was a lot of information. So if you want to sort of sum that up. Oh, absolutely. Um, yeah, really the difference is you would, you go to university for four or five years and you get a, a degree. And essentially an apprenticeship, most apprenticeships are between two and five years. And, and a lot of people today consider them equal to a degree because the same amount of work and the same amount of knowledge goes into both. But the nice thing about the apprenticeship is you don't finish, you finish typically certified in that career and your career really jumps from there. So you, there is a lot of advantages for apprenticeship. There's, a, there's different advantages for a university and college is nice because it is hands-on and in-class learning where it, it does a nice blend of both. And there is a workplace, quite often the workplace, um, especially the skilled trades, someone might go out into a workplace in what we call a non-apprenticeable skilled trade where you, there is no formal training, but the people learn on the job. Um, you know, a few examples, you know, there's concrete formers, there's, there's lots of different ones that learn on the job. And that could be an example of a workplace where they're learning on the job, maybe taking some courses, you know, to, uh, to learn more about that job. But there, there, there are the, basically the four different pathways. Thank you. There are two questions here, but they kind of run into each other. So I'm just going to ask them together that um, um, this parent is saying that their child is inclined to make animation um, a career because of the passion and is learning by, um, by um, themselves. So, and then there is another question that says that um, they want to get a list of all the skills trades um and um the available careers for animation coding robotics and computer programming so one is seeking for information and the other one is asking for more um the courses that they can um that they can take and what are the career paths for animation so that's why i lump them together because the answer to each of them will serve both of them So um, at Skills Ontario, we do promote careers in the technologies just as much as we promote careers in the skilled trades. We like to say that they kind of go hand in hand off oftentimes. Um, they are different a little, but they, but they sometimes do go hand in hand. So animation would be a career in the technologies usually. Um, and people usually go to college for, for careers in the technologies. I mean, you can go to university for it, but a lot of people are successful by, by, by going to college uh, for, for technology careers. Um, and yeah, one of the resources that I'm going to send um, after this presentation to the to your school board um, are multiple links that have in, like incomplete lists of careers in the skilled trades um, and all of the sort of steps you can do for all of them, like how many hours an apprenticeship program is, how much money somebody in that trade usually makes, um, some videos of people doing that trade so you can kind of see what the trade is like. Um, and so I will be sending all of that information to Manola and uh, wait, uh, Mr. Richardson and all of the people at your board um, after this presentation. Thank Thanks. you. Wedge, do you want to chip in? Absolutely. In the, in the Ontario curriculum, there are what they call 10 broad-based technologies. And as um, Jamie spoke earlier, there's construction, there's transportation, which is on focusing on automotive repair, small engines, that sort of thing. There's manufacturing. And in Halted, we have the courses are actually manufacturing, robotics, and uh, engineering, where there is a lot of um, coding and things like that that goes on with the robotics programs and fine machining. Um, Hairstylist, um, Comtech, so communications technologies, where that's typically a great course for someone who's interested in animation and that sort of thing, where the comm tech or communication technology is behind the camera. So they focus on what happens behind the camera and quite, and some of it is animation and it is, um, you know, creating media 
um, content. So there are courses in the, into the techno technological education that does focus on that type of thing. And ComTech would, communication technologies would have animation in that, a component of it. And there are some, there are some specialty programs that do focus on that type of um, part of the curriculum. Because we do have some programs they call focus um, courses where they focus on a particular part of that course. Thank you, uh, Wade. Um, the last question, although we are on time, um, but this last question is important. So this um, student wants to do, become an architect. So they want to know if there are any extra skilled trades program that would help them. Uh, that Wade, do you want again. to answer that question? Yes, that would probably be yes, again. You so again there are Wade. two courses that would kind of tie into architecture. An architect is a large um, umbrella of different types of architects. There are a lot of different ones and people tend to specialize. But part of architect is typically working with um, compute, the different computer programs, whether it's CAD or Fusion or things like that. So there are two of the, two of the, the, the BBTs, the broad-based technologies that, you, that would typically incorporate those learnings is construction, which you would do quite often, there's a design process where they would maybe have to design, draw things out on a computer. And quite often they have CNC machines in there where they would apply the, the um, drawings that they've made. The other, pro, the other one is technological design. In te technological design, the whole course is focused on the design process and building things. So a lot of it is computer-based and how to make things and, and be able to design things which is what an architect does. And part of the tech design course is understanding why you design those things and where, where um, how you would make it strong and where you, where, you need, where you can make it weaker in order to remove weight for, you know, in particular cases. So there are courses in, in um, technological education that really do apply to, the, to an architect. And I, I would suggest, you know, probably tech design would be the first one and construction would be one also. Thank you very much, Wade. So we have come to the end of um, this um, session. And if you're looking for more information, please feel free to visit bit.ly slash skilled trades resources. So, and then we'll be posting more information about um, all the resources that Angela is going to share with us. So we want to thank our keynote speaker, Jamie uh, McMillan. We also want to thank Angela uh, Wilkins from Skill Ontario. Thank you very much. We hope that parents and our students and grandparents and guardians have had a lot of um, information and exposure to the next steps because it's important to have the information so that we can have make informed decisions. So we thank everybody. We also thank the person who is making this um, go live, Mr. Kevin Raposo. He's always working behind the scenes. So thank you, everybody. And um, we'll see um, our parents, guardians, and students next week for the secondary portion of this program. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. Bye.